Well, sir, it's a few minutes past six o'clock as we enter the small house, halfway up in the next block now. And here in the kitchen, we find Mr. Rush Gook lingering over his evening meal. The young man has a volume of vigorous fiction propped up before him, and he reads absorbently as he demolishes a piece of pie. And here's his mother approaching. Listen. We got company, Rush. Have we? Uncle Fletcher's out on the front porch. Oh? Come out and help me entertain him. Okay. Oh, well, finish your pie first. Well, I am finished except for one bite. I just ran in to make sure I turned off my oven. I knew I turned it off. Would bet anybody nine million dollars I turned it off. But a person have the slightest doubt about something that's just not easy in their mind till they've checked up. Had you turned it off? Yeah. Huh. I'm getting like Ruthie in her letters. She'll put on a postage stamp and look at it 18 times to be positive she has put on a postage stamp. And call me to witness she put on a postage stamp. And by gollies, once she's dropped the letter in the mailbox, she begins to get apprehensive she forgot to put on a postage stamp. <laughs> <laughs> What's new with Uncle Fletcher? He's going to stay all night with us. <laughs> yeah? He showed up out in front with his valise just now. Nightgown and easy slippers and things inside. What's the idea? Another one of his notions. <laughs> he decided we needed a man in the house. <laughs> well. Come on, let's go keep him company. You'll start feeling neglected. How about the supper dishes? Uh, we'll do them later. For a man in the house, huh? Ain't that crazy? gov has been away almost a whole month now. He's due back in a few days and... Right on the tail end of it all, Uncle Fletcher makes up his mind we ought to have a man here nights to protect us. <laughs> That's like Uncle Fletcher. Yes. Sadie, I said to my landlady this evening, Miss Keller, my niece's husband is out of town, and her and her little boy are all alone nights. I believe I ought to pack my valise Get and go over and stay with them. But a boy <laughs> Who's he hollering at? Didn't he say Bluetooth? Bluetooth's in Peoria. Oh. <laughs> I believe Russ is inside eating his supper, Bluetooth. Wonder who that is. Well, maybe Bluetooth got back from Peoria. He only just left at 5 o'clock. Oh. <laughs> Hello there. Evening, Rush. Finished your supper, did you? Yeah. Fine. Your friend Bluetooth Johnson uh, just come along the other side of the street. Did he? Yeah, you can still see. Who is it? Willis Roybeck. Bluetooth's a good boy. Uh-huh. Bluetooth's okay. Say, Uncle Fletcher, I forgot to ask you. How about a piece of apple pie? No, thanks, Sadie. It's very nice. I'll be pushing my supper pretty close later, helping a pie. Well, maybe a little bit later. Fine. I brought my valise, Rush. Yeah, Mom was telling me. I understand you're going to stay tonight. Uh-huh. Notion hit me you ought to have a man in the house that's thick away and all. Oh? That's what notion hit me at the supper table, Sadie. Did it? Yes, it did. I was just about to put a bite of beef steak in my mouth. I laid down my knife and I said to my landlady, Miss Culler, I said, my niece's husband is out of town. And her and her little boy are all alone. They ought to have a man in the house by George. Uh-huh. Ought to have a man in the house by George. Uh-huh. She agreed. We're real glad to have you. Oh, uh-huh. I'll take my valise upstairs directly. All right. I'll take my valise upstairs now. <laughs> no hurry. Bye. Uncle Fletcher, this afternoon in Tapman's vacant lot, me and Leroy Snow had a discussion That's about so? this. Oh? <laughs> yeah. No, Sadie, one reason I decided to come spend the night with you and Rush, I noticed this evening where the paper stated sharp thunderstorms. Oh? Women and children are timid about thunderstorms. Man in the house during thunderstorms makes them more easy in their mind. Well, I'm not afraid of thunderstorms. Neither am I. Never have been. Bye. No, come up heavy rain later on with lightning and wind. Just remember, I'm in the next bedroom going back to sleep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. There's nothing to be scared of. Uh, uh, same way with burglars. Uh, that's something I am afraid of. Uh-huh. No, you see any burglars skulking around, just remember I'm in the next bedroom going back to sleep. Oh, all right. I'll handle Mr. Burglar. Master Scott was telling about some burglar in Burlington, Iowa that... Made the mistake. Indeed, every time. Uh-huh. Talking about being timid when it comes to thunderstorms, old Sadie. Do you remember Ernie Femer, their addiction? Mm, no. Brother to Art Femer that always wore five neckties when he dressed up on Sundays? Mm, no. Ernie Femer wasn't afraid of snakes or mad dogs or wildcats or nothing. But he was afraid of thunderstorms. 
Hmm. Come up a thunderstorm, and Ernie Thiem would go home and crawl under the bed every trip. Done that even when he was a man 46 years old. Oh, just think. Eunice Rayfold's awful scared of lightning and thunder. I've seen her in algebra class where she trembled. Sure, and... you remember Ernie Femer, Sadie. Mm, the name don't sound at all familiar. He married into the VP family. <laughs> I don't even remember the VP family. Walter M. VP. He was the fellow that drowned in the Missouri River, wasn't he? Yes. Walter M. VP got drowned in the Missouri River. And he had a brother. He had a brother that got drowned in the Ohio River. Yeah. Had another brother that got drowned in the Mississippi River. Mm-hmm. Had still another brother. <laughs> yeah. Had still another brother, say. Yes. That never got drowned at all. Goodness. Walter M. Beep. Mm-hmm. I better start thinking about taking my police upstairs, likely. I'll do it, Uncle Fletcher. Uh huh. Works out that way sometimes. <laughs> uh-huh. What time do you folks generally turn in? Oh, it varies. Varies, huh? Yes. Every once in a while, we'll go to bed as early as 9, 30, or 10. Of course, if Mr. and Miss Timbottom are here playing cards or company's present, maybe we won't go upstairs till... I saw Ted this afternoon. Who? Ted. <laughs> Ted Stembottom. Oh, Fred, Uncle Fletcher. His name is Fred. Fine. He was very affable. Cracked a joke or two. What was that joke about the horse he cracked? Uh-huh. What was that joke about the horse Ted cracked, right? <laughs> I wasn't there. A very funny joke, whatever it was. <laughs> 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 very funny joke. Yes, sir. That Ted is a card. Uh-huh. Ought to be thinking about bed, I expect, pretty quick. Bed? Fine. Well, it's not 6.30 yet. I don't think it's even 6.15 yet. Time a fellow locks up around and stuff, he's liable to find out it's later than he thought. Oh, right, Uncle Fletcher, you're welcome to turn in any minute you feel like it. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I don't think I'll go to bed at 6.30. No, time a fellow locks up around and stuff, he's liable to find out it's later than he thought. We only got two doors to lock. Put the milk bottle on the porch and so forth. All right, don't take but a second. Clock's got to be wound up. Bedroom window's open to get the breeze. Fellow's liable to run into a knot in his shoestring. That gets late time to add it up. <laughs> Maybe we ought to start preparing for bed around noon. <laughs> yeah. Talking about knots in your shoestring, Sadie, I'll tell you another story on Ernie Femer. All right. Ernie's brother Art used to tell this story on Ernie. Probably you recollect Ernie Femer's brother Art. No, I don't believe I do. Put on five neckties when he dressed up nice for Sundays? Mm, no. Art Femer didn't stay in Dixon long. Moved to Spabble City, Kentucky on his 21st birthday. Married a Kentucky woman, according to what fellows say. Kentucky woman, 18 years old. No, take that back. It was a Tennessee woman he married. A Tennessee woman, 18 years old. Her father was so loose-jointed, he could lay down on the ground and spell out the letters of the alphabet just by writhing and twisting his body of legs and arms. Heck, he could. Yes. How would he shape himself into the letter M? I. An X. Uh Uh-huh. No, but this story they tell on Ernie Fever... Seems he got a knot in his shoestring, and there wasn't any button hook or nothing handy, and he struggled all night long before he got his shoe off. He got his shoe off at 6 o'clock in the morning, and at that very minute, the alarm clock went off, and he had to put his shoe back on and go to work. My stars. I'd have just slept in my shoe. Ernie was very sluggish on the job that day. Every once in a while, he'd look at his foot and say... Darn you, you a rotten old shoe, you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm astonished you don't place Ernie, Sadie. Uh, Married into the VP family and all. Uh, Walter and VP got drowned in the Missouri River. You gonna tell that again? <laughs> Looks like it. Had a brother that got drowned in the Ohio River. Had another brother that got drowned in the Mississippi River. Had still another brother. Had still another brother, Sadie. Yes. Yeah. That never got drowned at all. Land. Walter M. Baby. I guess Uncle Fletcher's right about the thunderstorms. Yeah. See how it's clouding up over west there? Uh-huh. We can use nice rain. Uh-huh. Feel a little easier in your mind with the man in the house, Sadie? Yes. Yeah. No, she'd hit me at the half-wet supper table. I laid down my knife and I said, 
Miss Collette, my niece's husband's out of town and her and her little boy are all alone. We will pack my valise and spend the night over there. Uh-huh. She agreed. She's a very fine landlady, Miss Keller. Yes. So, Rush, if you hear lightning and thunder later on, just remember, I'm in the next bedroom going back to sleep. Okay. Happen to see burglars skulking around. Pay no attention. I'll be in the next bedroom. Uh-huh. I'll settle Mr. Burglar's hash. Mm-hmm. Well, Sadie, shall we commence thinking about turning in? It's not 6.30 yet, Uncle Fletcher. Why? <laughs> I'm not going to bed at any 6.30. Uh-huh. Time for a locks up, Rob. Winds the clock, puts out the milk bottle, <laughs> raises the window to get the breeze and so on. He's liable to find out it's later than he bargained for. Mm-hmm. You say you had an extra piece of pie out in the kitchen? Yes. Don't expect it to push my supper too close if I eat it now. Not at all. Do you want to go out in the kitchen, or shall I fix the plate and bring it? Little Tooth Johnson across the street again. <laughs> That's Willis Roarback, Uncle Fletcher. Uh-huh. Isn't that Bluetooth? It's not Bluetooth. It's Willis Roarback. Why? Better get on home, Bluetooth. Looks like rain. Bluetooth's a good boy. Yes, yeah. he yeah. is. <laughs> Which concludes another brief interlude at the small house, halfway up in the next block. Well, sir, the evening meal has been over only a little while as we enter the small house halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. and Mrs. Gook and their son, Mr. Rush Gook, abiding quietly at home. Said is saying... You don't have to think about that already, do you? Sure. But Christmas is so far away. Oh, not so far away. And you're saddled with the job again this year. Uh-huh. Why do you let people impose on you? Somebody has to take the rap. Must it always be you? <laughs> Looks like it. Mm. Oh, I did make a nice present for Mr. Rubish. Easy, Slippers. Every year I ask the question, why did make a nice present for Mr. Rubish? And every year you answer, easy, Slippers. Easy, Slippers is always good things to give. But the money collected from the employees generally runs around 35 or 40 dollars. Do you know where easy slippers can be purchased at that price? We'll give them a whole bedroom outfit. Robe, pajamas, easy slippers, smoking jacket, all like that. Not a very original present. Well, you asked me. Unless I select something pretty suitable, I'm open to criticism. Well, how about a... Uh, two, four, five, seven, J, please. Correct. Ever know it to fail? The minute a person start up a conversation, kids hop right to the telephone. I'm calling Smelly Clark. What for? Remind him he owes me eight cents. Mm. How about a lovely valise? Mr. Rubish has got valises by the million. Well, nowadays, though, they sell valises for lots of different purposes. Fellas carry a special valise for their shirts, special valise for their shoes, special... Ah, valise. there, Smelly. I find you at home, do I? Uh-huh. Just thought I'd ring you up, thought I'd remind you you owe me eight cents. Uh-huh. That was all. You bet. Goodbye. No, kiddo. He's got all the luggage he needs. Why, it's Christmas. The fellas down at the foundry give their boss a set of pipes. Tobacco pipes? Uh-huh. All different shapes and sizes. Mr. Ruby smokes cigars. Give him cigars. Oh. 2596W, please. Correct. Who's this now? Vernon Pagos. He owes me money, too. How many other boys are you going to call? Oh, thought I might give Bluetooth Chance in a ring. Also, Leland Richards. Maybe a little later on, I'll attempt to get in touch with Milton Wells, Rooster Dave. Uh, do I hear the voice of Vernon Pagos on the other end of the wire? Rice Cook. Did you get to use the telephone as a plaything when you were his age? Telephones weren't in general use when I was his age. Had be steak and mashed potatoes for supper, eh, Vernon? I bet they tasted good. Uh-huh. Yes, that's a fact. Beef steak and mashed potatoes hit the spot. Excellent quality handkerchiefs with his initials in the corner. Handkerchiefs yeah, don't make a very original Christmas present. Yes, fish hits the spot too when you're hungry. Well, handkerchiefs is articles a man can always use. Sure. They're not very really flashy. Oh, good. Be flashy. Goodness, this person can pay up to five dollars a piece for handkerchiefs. You're right there, Vernon. Cheese hits the spot. Cake hits the spot. Green olives hits the spot. Oh, come right down to it. I expect anything hits a spot if an individual is hungry. I read in the newspaper where somebody paid $50 for a handkerchief. Oh. If I told my employees uh, I took their $50 of donations yeah. and invested it in a single handkerchief for the boss, they'd think I was pocketing considerable sway. I'll say chicken gravy hits a spot. That's a bright conversation. Yeah. 
Well, I just happened to be sitting around the living room here, Vernon, and thought I'd remind you you owe me a nickel. Not at all. Thanks very much for answering the phone. Okay. Goodbye. That'll be enough of that, Graskell. Enough of what? Exchange a nitwit remarks with your lame brain pals. I am on the point of calling Bluetooth Johnson. Uh Uh-uh. Go away from the phone. Surely you wouldn't object to me calling Leland Richards. Go away from the phone. I'll ring up Milton Welch and then call it a day. Go away from the phone. Mr. Rubish liked candy. I don't know. He must have noticed on your trip whether he ate much candy or not. He ate some candy. Much candy? He ate occasional candy. In Dubuque, Iowa, one evening, he stepped to the candy counter in the hotel and bought a hunk of candy. A big hunk? <laughs> he didn't buy a hunk as big as a piano stool or anything. He bought the size hunk you get for five cents. Reason I ask, the Greek downtown's got lovely bargains and candy. I doubt very much if the boss had relished 35 or $40 dollars worth of candy. We'd have to load it up in a coal wagon and have it shoveled in his basement. Buy him an assortment of useful articles. Candy, handkerchiefs, easy slippers, cigars. Shoestrings, fingernail file, poster stamp, toothbrush, rice water, bookmark, eye cup, bicycle, pants guards, guardian. Oh, no, but a person could use their common sense. The half-wit gift kiddo ought to be something that shows good taste and smart selecting. The difficulty is, of course, that Mr. Rubish already owns so much... I'll get it. Friend Ruthie? No, Fred's putting in overtime at the foundry tonight. Mm. Hello? Oh, yes, Russell. Russell Duncan, by George. Mm. Uh, and how are you, old fella? Good. Yes, I know I owe you nine cents. Uh-huh. Thanks very much for reminding me. Not at all. You bet. Okay, Russell. Sure thing. Goodbye. Good old dependable Russell Duncan. Took all the time and trouble to remind me I owe him nine cents. Mm. Why all this sudden interest in collecting money, Willie? I'm collecting money, ma'am, so as to be able to buy some more defense savings stamps. And in order to oh, do that... Oh, well, that's a horse of a different color. Everybody should buy as many defense saving stamps as they can. The thimble ladies are saving up for stamps, so and I'm that. on the defense saving stamps committee. Oh. Uh, 6590R, please. You're right. No more telephones now, Rush. Wait till your father and I finish this important talk. How about a comfortable chair for beside his bed? I think we may assume he already has a comfortable chair for beside his bed. Comfortable chair for beside his desk down the office, then. Greetings there, Leroy. I successfully found you at home, I see. Uh Uh-huh. Well, didn't have much on my mind except that I thought I ought to call it to your attention again. You owe me a dime. Uh Uh-huh. Not at all. Only too pleased to hear the sound of your voice. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, old fella. Vic, how about a comfortable chair for beside his desk down at the office? He's got three chairs beside his desk down at the office. They're all leather and must have cost over a hundred dollars a piece. Oh. Seven two three nine L, please. Correct. Office furniture is an idea, though. I mean, some knickknack or other that would be useful and ornamental. Footstool, maybe. Umbrella holder. Mm, something on that order. Hello, I am speaking to Arnold Shipley, I believe. <laughs> yep, that's right. Nice stuff. Didn't you tell him to get away from that half-wit phone? Well, for golly sakes. Hey, you... Glad to hear you're enjoying robust health, Arnold. Uh, one second, please. This is Arnold Shipley. What did I tell you a minute ago? I expect you refer to what was said... I said get away from there. All right. Pardon the delay, Arnold. I feel first-rate, thanks. Uh Uh-huh. No, nothing important. It just occurred to me perhaps you'd like to be reminded you owe me four cents. Uh Uh-huh. Yes, that's what I thought. Sure thing, Arnold. You bet. Goodbye, Arnold. Well, what kind of obedience is that? I distinctly give you orders to go away from... The telephone is ringing by, George. Uh Uh-huh. One of these times it'll be disconnected to where it can't ring. Hello? Hello, Willis. Good old Willis Rohrbeck. How are you, fella? A picture of somebody? You Uh, mean as a Christmas present for the boss? Yes. Think of that. A picture of who? Oh, anybody. In a fine, big, expensive frame, don't you know? I'm astonished at that news, Willis. Or scenery. A picture showing the Mississippi River in the moonlight, or the Rocky Mountains with snow on top, or like that. Well... You uh, sure hit the nail on the head that trip, Willis. Uh Uh-huh. Well, wonderful of you to inconvenience yourself by phoning me up, old fella. Yes, sir. How true. Yeah. 
Okay, Willis. Goodbye. Good old defendable Willis Roybeck. Hamilton has wonderful pictures for sale nowadays, you know. Uh -huh. Furniture department. I was noticing them the other day. Mm -hmm. One real cute one showed a baby in a basket with Pop and Mama leaning over it, kissing it goodnight. <laughs> I doubt if that would be appropriate to hang up in a businessman's office. Oh, no, of course not. Just uh, an example to show you the elegant merchandise they got. And then there was another uh, showing the sun coming up. Over oh, for here. Pete's sake. Now, uh, this is getting outrageous, Rush. Can I help it if my dear old friends take it in their noodle to get in touch with that? Right. Okay. Drive us to where we'll have to sit in the basement evenings. Hello? Why, well, yes, Cracky. Cracky Otto by Jordan. Oh. Uh, delighted to hear the tones of your voice, Cracky. You like the picture idea? Yeah. Oh. Fine as hell, Cracky. Never felt better. Of course, it'd have to be something appropriate. Oh, sure. Just thought you'd refresh my mind of the fact I owe you seven cents, eh, Cracky? Uh-huh. True. Who's this he's talking to? I don't know. Cracky somebody. Oh, Cracky my, yes. Cracky Otto. He the lad with skull cap and tennis shoes? Yeah, he's the one that comes... True, Cracky. I agree. Sure, I'll pay sometime or other. Not at all. Not at all. Mighty generous of you to go to the bother of reminding me. You bet. Okay, Cracky. Goodbye, Cracky. Good old trustworthy Cracky Otto. Why do you let yourself get saddled with a job of picking out Mr. Rubish's Christmas presents year after year after year? Well, somebody's got to do but it. But why always you? The guys down at the office gang up on me. They elect me chairman of the committee and then leave everything in my lap. I wouldn't stand for it. Uh -huh. Mom... May I call a piney Now, call? I'd tell him where to get off at. Mm -hmm. The minute I'd tell him where to get off at. Mm -hmm. Mom. Huh? May I telephone Heine call? Telephone Heine call? Yeah. That makes no difference to me. No? I don't care who you telephone. Fine. Why can't I knees up for some of them be the goat once in a while? Mm -hmm. Five, five, four, two, L, please. Correct. Let Steve Chessbutter pick out a Christmas present for Mr. Rubush. Mm -hmm. He's a great big, able-bodied man. Sure. Hello? Am I listening to the tones in the voice of good old Heine Kaw? How are you, Heine? How are you? Which concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block. Well, sir, it's 15 minutes past 9 o'clock in the morning as our scene opens now. And here in the living room of the small house halfway up in the next block we find Mrs. Victor Gook all by herself. Mrs. Gook is at the telephone chatting with her friend and confidant, Mrs. Frederick Stenbottom. And we hear her say, regretfully, Gee, Ruthie, I'd like to, but I'm afraid I just can't. No, I've laid out a whole big smear of work for myself this morning. I thought I'd clean my downstairs and really get in the corners. Yes, I've been kind of slighting my dust in here lately. Giving stuff just a lick and a promise, don't you know? <laughs> uh, well, if you're going downtown to Hamilton's, you might pick me up a dozen or so wash rags, if they're what they're cracked up to be in the advertisement. Oh, I'll leave it to you what to pay. Sure. Everybody home. Uh-huh. Uh, just a second, Ruthie. Somebody out in back. Yes. Bailey. Hello, Uncle Fletcher. I'm in the living room. Why? It's Uncle Fletcher, Ruthie. Uh-huh. Oh, he's apt to drop in any time. <laughs> I'm afraid I'll have to send him along about his business. <laughs> yes, I'm determined to put this house to rights this morning. All right, nice lady. Well, Ruthie, I'd love to run downtown with you, lady, but I guess I'd better not. You go ahead and see what you can accomplish on the wash rag question. Somebody around on the telephone? All right. Well, call me up this noon and report on how you come out. <laughs> you bet. All righty, Ruthie. Goodbye. Well, Uncle Fletcher. Good morning, Sadie. Good morning. You look fresh and bright. Yes. Glorious day. Uh-huh. I haven't been out, but I noticed through the window it looked nice. Vic gone to the office, likely. Oh, goodness, long ago. Fine. Rush off to school, I expect. Yes, he left the house with his father. I hope the teacher don't have to flog you. <laughs> it's 
strolled over to Ed Huller's gasoline station after breakfast and found out my George Ed's homesick in bed. Nothing serious. Oh, no. Hmm. Chest pulls off. Mm. Ed ought to be up and around by tomorrow. Uh-huh. Young Ollie Price is running the gas station while Ed's sick. Oh, really? You busy doing something, Sadie? Oh, I got time to visit a little bit. Going someplace, are you? Oh, lands, no. Just had an invitation to go someplace, though. That was Miss Stembottom on the phone just now. The Hamiltons are having a big sale on wash rags this morning. She called up to ask me to run down with her. Why? But I got work mapped out. Gonna get after this downstairs and really make it shine. Uh-huh. Been putting it off for days. No, I just happened to be passing by. Well, I'm glad you stopped in. I'm afraid, though, you'll have to excuse me pretty soon, because if I'm going to accomplish... Watch your elbow, Uncle Fletcher. Oh, cup and saucer, huh? Oh, I shouldn't have left him on the arm of the damn poor. I brought coffee in here after breakfast while I looked over last evening's newspaper. Here, I'll take care of it. Sit still. I can just do well. Uh Uh-oh. Drat it. I went to pick up the half-wit saucer by the bottom so no coffee would spill out and damage the carpet. Well, I should have used both hands and picked up the cup by the handle and seen to it that the saucer... Accidents happen. No harm done. Uh Uh-huh. I'll go get a cloth. All right. Believe that coffee cup was chipped anyway. Yes. You say you're going to clean the downstairs this morning? Clean and dust. I'll help dust. Oh, no. Sure, I'll help dust. Well, I couldn't think of it for a minute, Uncle Flake. Bring a dust drag. I'll help dust. Got nothing else particular to do anyway. Oh, wait a second while I fetch a cloth to wipe up that coffee. I've got one right here on the buffet. Bring a chamois skin dust drag if you've got it, Sadie. I like chamois skin dust drags when I dust. We'll talk about it when I get back. I'll pick up these hunks of busted cup and saucer. All right. Sadie? Yes? I'll pick up these hugs of busted cup and saucer. All right. No, what I should have done was grab the lame brain dishes with both hands. Or I made my mistake with just using the one hand. I hear what you're saying. What? I was just going to say if you... W- oh, you didn't pick up the broken cup and saucer yet. Fine. Brought the chamois skin, did you? I don't have any chamois skin. Chamois skins will make first-rate dust strikes. Paula can get a good grip on a chamois skin. Uh, Uncle Fletcher, I'm just not going to consider you helping me with the housework. I've got the job all mapped out exactly the way I want it done. Here, I'll pick up them pieces. All right. As long as I've done the busting. I'm the party that ought to break their back picking up the glass. Mm-hmm. Got chamois skins for both of us, have you? There's not a chamois skin in the house. You just got one chamois skin. Save it for yourself. I haven't got any chamois skin. I skins. can use some old worn-out rag. Say, as long as I'm on my hands and knees, I might as well look around the rug here. See if I can't find my glasses case. Well, you won't be down there. Lost my half with glasses case last week. I've gone over the rug since last week, I think. Uh-huh. No... Oh, no, seem to be able to locate it. Mm-hmm. Funny thing. Uh-huh. No place inside. Well, I'm sure you couldn't have left it here. Why? Somebody would have found it by this time. Yes. Yeah. Hi, George. I must be getting old. Kind of a job for me to get up off my hands and knees. I'll pick up the pieces of cup and saucer if you'll just move to one side here. Why, I never done that. Went all the trouble squat down on the floor and then never picked up the busted dishes. Well, I will. No, no, you take it easy. Yeah. Oh, why? Just a trifle stiff and the joints is my trouble. I think I'll pitch in with my dusting if you don't mind, Uncle Fletcher. It's getting on for ten o'clock, and if I'm going to come... I believe that's the Nitwit telephone again. Yes. You better go ahead and answer. It takes me so long to get up off my hands and knees. A party probably hang up like nobody was home. Hello? Oh, yes, Miss Trogel. Finest silk, thanks. And you folks? Elegant. Oh? Well, Miss Trogel, Miss Stembottom just now phoned and asked me to do that same thing. No, I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> no, I've mapped out a great big smear of work around the house here. Boy. I thought I'd give my downstairs a going over. Needs it just terrible bad, and I promised myself I'd get after it this morning. Say. So I guess I better say no this time, Miss Drogel. <laughs> I can't go back on the promise I made myself, you know. 
Uh, What'll I do with these hunks of cup and saucer, Sadie? Yes, according to the paper, Yamilton's are almost giving good quality wash rags away. What'll I do with this junk, Sadie? Just a second, Uncle Fletcher. Uh-huh. Well, I'd like to, but I'd better not. Some other day soon we will. You bet. Well, thanks anyway for asking me, Miss Trogle. Uh-huh. Yes, indeedy, I will. Goodbye, Miss Trogle. Where do you want this busted cup and saucer, Sadie? Oh, if you'll put them here in my apron, I'll take them out in the kitchen. Oh, oh, say, by George. Well, you couldn't have expected them to stay in your hands the way you were holding them. Fine. No, they slipped on me. It happens occasionally. You, you take busted cups and saucers nine times. Well, don't get down on your hands and knees anymore. I'm the party that broke the hat. I can pick up the chunks just by leaning over. You stay on your feet. All right. Where's my chamois skin? I'll come and dust in the floor lamp. Where's my chamois skin, Sadie? I haven't got any chamois skin. I'll commence dusting the floor lamp. No, the floor lamp don't require dusting. I use a damp cloth on the floor lamp. Lock him till the hold. Oh, wait, I'll answer it. Ring this off every morning, does it? No. Fine. I Hello. remember Yarder's grocery store going oh, yes, over there. Miss Bryan. I had one of the first telephones uh, ever installed in that Well, of yes, town. I am busy. One t- I'm going to clean my downstairs. Uh. Oh, are you? Well, both Miss Stambottom and Miss Trogel called and asked me to go with them to Hamilton's. Uh-huh. Wonderful bargains, I guess. Uh-huh. I'd like to, Miss Brighton, and thanks very much, but I'm just determined to put this place to rights today. Yes. Well, we'll do it next time. All right, Miss Brighton. You bet. Goodbye. I started to tell you, Sadie, about the old Tom Yarder that run the grocery salon in Belvedere years ago. Another fellow by South well, Buckley playing play a joke on old Tom, so we fixed it what up What are you doing with... with that floor lamp? Big pardon? Where'd you get that rag? This rag? Isn't that the rag Found I... Found it on the arm of the Davenport there. Well, that's the rag I brought in to mop up to spill coffee with. Fine. Oh, I, I just... Well, don't rub my lamp with it. You'll ruin... It. Hey! What's the matter well, here? Well, catch it, catch it, it falls. Half with floor lamp. Oh, couldn't you see it was going to fall? Couldn't you put out your hands and caught it when you noticed it was... Telephone's ringing, Sadie. Just leave the floor lamp where it is. Uh, telephone is ringing. I'll answer it. No, what happened no. was... Uh, I went to... Oh, yes, Miss Donahue? Yes, I understand there is. Why? I'd love to. Yes. Yes, I've got quite a few on hand, but a person can always use wash rags. Yes. Why, I can be ready to leave in ten minutes. Yes. All right, meet you out in front. All right, Miss Donahue. Goodbye. What happened, Sadie? Uncle Fletcher, I'm going downtown shopping. Oh? There's a big wash rag sale on at Yamilton's. I'd, I think I better take advantage of. Fine. I'm I'm leaving in ten minutes. Uh huh. I guess I left my hat out on the kitchen table. <laughs> Which concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block. Well, sir, it's late afternoon as our scene opens now. And here in the living room of the small house, halfway up in the next block, we find Mr. Rush Gook all by himself. The young man is seated at the library table, gazing without enthusiasm at his open algebra textbook. He pauses in his labors at this particular moment, however, because he hears sounds in the kitchen. Listen. That you, man? Hi. Hi, girl. Mom in there? No. Oh, say. She's downtown. Say. She's not here, Gus. She's downtown. Oh, that's right. Don't you remember at the dinner table this noon, she said she was going downtown? Oh, yeah. Darn it. Something special? <laughs> I call it something special. Flypaper, old shoehorn. Your father has been asked to make a speech. Oh, where are you going to speak? Right, Kentucky Hotel. Oh, <laughs> Why are you amused and incredulous? You're fooling, ain't you? Why should I be fooling? <laughs> Break a Dougie Hotel. 
The Bright Kentucky Hotel, I admit, is a humble establishment. Still and all, though, I expect as many honest hearts beat stout and true there as any place else. The well, Bright Kentucky Hotel is the last location on earth I'd expect anybody to make a speech at. Probably the reason for that is that you're young, inexperienced, and unimportant. <laughs> okay. Are you busy there? Just glancing over to Mars algebra assignment is all. You can help me if you care to. What doing? You can act in the capacity of my secretary in preparing the address I'm giving tonight. Giving it tonight, huh? At 8.30. In the lobby at the Bright Kentucky? Yep. Who's going to be your audience? The guests of the hotel. <laughs> yeah. Is that funny also? Well, all the guys that live at the Bright Kentucky are not the sort of fellas. Right? I have no doubt I'm cheating myself out of a hearty belly laugh by interrupting you, cow pasture, but I'd like to get down to business. Uh-huh. Time passes and I have to get my oration in shape. Uh-huh. Uh, step to the bookcase and get me volumes 2, 3, 4, 7, and 9 of the large library. Uh-huh. Who asked you to talk at the Bright Kentucky? Stacy Yap. Oh. He's in residence there. Yeah, I know it. Also, the other two barbers from the Butler House Barbershop. Y.A.I.Y. Skeever and Alf Musherton. That's right. Here you are. Volumes 2, 3, 4, 7, and 9. Thanks, George. Oh. If I spoke harshly a moment ago, I apologize. Not at all. You saw fit to sneer at the Bright Kentucky Hotel, which was more thoughtlessness on your part than malice. <laughs> I wasn't sneering at it. Just struck me as a comical place uh-huh. to go. Well, no matter. Now you may turn to page uh, 163 in volume 7. 163. I've decided to select as my subject the importance of good sportsmanship in modern business. Huh. Want to know the occasion for the speech, old cold chisel? <laughs> yeah, I was just about to ask that. <laughs> you continue to snort, gurgle, and guffaw. Well, I can't help it if it strikes me funny, the idea of anybody making a speech in the lobby of the Bright Kentucky Hotel. Stout hearts be the strong and true in the lobby of the Bright Kentucky Hotel as any place else. <laughs> I suppose. If you can keep from howling with laughter six seconds, I'll tell you the occasion for my speech. Okay. The guests at the Bright Kentucky Hotel are all bachelors. Yes, I know they are. Some of them are elderly men and lonely. My friend Stacy Yop got to thinking the matter over and decided it would be a good stunt to entertain him some way one evening every week. He hit on the notion of inviting speakers. Oh, uh-huh. I have the honor of being selected as the first speaker. Oh. Nice? Yes. I consider it nice. Uh-huh. And I give credit to Stacy Yop for being an all-round good fella. Yeah. Have you turned to page 163 in volume 7? Right here. I've selected as my topic the importance of good sportsmanship in modern business. Uh-huh. Now, beginning at the top of page 163 in volume 7, you may read aloud, if you please. Uh, yeah. Yes? Is anybody else besides the guests at the Bright Kentucky Hotel going to be in the audience? No. It's going to be an awful little audience, then. Why? There's only 11 guys living at the Bright Kentucky right now. Where did you pick up that information? Well, Smelly Clark's uncle's trap is night clerk down there, you know. I've heard you say so, yes. Well, he told Smelly the Bright Kentucky only had 11 rooms rented, and Smelly told me. Hmm? The management's getting kind of desperate. See, a hotel with only 11 rooms rented is running at Well, almost. no matter, no matter. 11's enough. Won't be a fashionable audience, and it won't be a large audience, but I'm willing to... Telephone thing. I'll get it. I thought of another angle. What's that? Mr. Gumpox and Mr. Jeffrey and Mr. Cunningham won't be on deck to hear you. A new moving picture's open. Uh, just a second, George. No. Hello? Oh, yes, Al. Been talking to Stacy, I bet. Ha-ha. <laughs> uh, that's right, Al. If I speak at 8.30. Gonna be on deck, are you? Oh. Sick friend, huh? I see. Well, you can listen to me fling oratory around the next time, then. Okay, Alf. You bet. So long. Alf Musherton? Uh-huh. He won't be on hand to hear you speak? He has to go visit a sick friend. Oh. What did you start to say a minute ago when I picked up the telephone receiver? Oh, I was just going to mention the fact that Mr. Gumpox and Mr. Jeffrey and Mr. Cunningham won't be on hand either. Who are Mr. Jeffrey and Mr. Cunningham? Well, a couple of old fellas that live at the Bray, Kentucky. Why won't they be on hand? Because there's a new moving picture opening tonight at the Bijo. Those three fellas, Mr. Gumpox, Mr. Jeffrey, and Mr. Cunningham, wouldn't miss the first night for a million dollars. See, they got a reputation for attending new moving pictures on the nights they open, and they're proud of their reputation. Why, well, I can tell you for well, a All right, fact, uh, let's get on with our business here and cut out a little of the twaddle. Beginning at the top of page 163 in volume 7. Kindly read it out. Oh. I must get some ideas on good sportsmanship and modern business. Um, well? 
Mr. Montgomery and Mr. Slatcher are completely deaf. And who are Mr. Montgomery and Mr. Slatcher, pray? A couple of old fellows that reside at the Bright Kentucky. They are completely deaf? Yes. Why are you making me privy to the information? I just thought you'd be interested, was all. Makes two more guests at the Bright Kentucky Hotel that won't hear your speech. Yeah. Well, beginning at the top of page 163 in volume 7. Kindly read it out. I beat my breast in agony. I clutch my throat with rage. The wild beasts of the jungle are not one half so dangerous as I. The frosty moon shines... Cell phone's ringing. I hear it. One side. Oh. The material you just read doesn't suggest any ideas about good sportsmanship and modern business. You may turn to page uh, 47 in volume 9. Okay. Hello? Oh, yes, why, I, I, why? <laughs> Heard about it, did you? <laughs> oh, I'm not the world's greatest orator or anything, but if I can give a talk that'll cheer up some of them elderly fellows a little, I'm only too glad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You'll be on deck, I suppose. Why, I, I, why? Oh. Uh-huh. I see. That's too bad. Well, I'm sorry, too. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, okay. You bet. Goodbye. Why, I, I, why, Skeever? Mm. He won't be on hand tonight? No. What's the matter? I asked to see his grandfather off on the train. Oh. Well, have you turned to page 47, volume 9? Yeah. Read aloud, please. What's the matter now? Uh, I told you there were 11 guys living at the Bright Kentucky. Yes. I was wrong. Yeah. I had an idea you were wrong. There's only ten. Uh, ten? Mr. Yammerly got fired from his job on the railroad day before yesterday and went to Niles, Michigan to live with his brother-in-law. Where do you get all these fascinating bulletins? Smelly Clark's Uncle Strap tells Smelly and Smelly tells me. Read it out. Uh, in hot disputanum, dum clark sheesh. Ad infinitum, spinach, sim, spittle, honk. Pluribus... Naturally, I'm not going to make a speech in Latin. Well, you told me to... Get down. Oh. Read where the English begins. Oh. Sweetheart, your eyes are like limpid pools seen by moonlight in the deep forest. Your soft hands put to shame the velvet petals of the hyacinth. Oh, would that well, I might... Who you say them slobs are that are going to go to the moving picture show tonight? Mr. Gumpox, Mr. Jeffrey, and Mr. Cunningham. Mm. Your soft hands put to shame the velvet petals... And who of... are the guys that are hard of hearing? Mr. Montgomery and Mr. Slatcher. Makes five guys. Yeah. Why, 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 Skeever and Alf Musher didn't big dog. Huh? Seven guys. Hmm. You're sure there's only ten guys live at the Bright Kentucky Hotel? Positive. There's three guys to hear me make a speech. I thought of another angle. You suddenly remembered the three guys that make up my audience died this afternoon? <laughs> no. Well, what's your angle? You say your talk is scheduled for 8.30? Yes. That's just when they start switching freight trains around in the railroad yards there. Loudest noise you ever heard in your life. Why, people can't even carry on a conversation in the lobby of the Bright Kentucky. I don't see how anybody can make a speech with locomotives letting off steam and whistles blowing. You and may bell. read. Beg pardon? You may read aloud from volume 9, oh. page 47. Oh. Uh, sweetheart, your eyes are like limpid pools seen by moonlight in the deep forest. Your pale hands put to shame the velvet petals of the hyacinth. Oh, that was has it a... little bearing on the importance of good sportsmanship in modern business. Well, I can't help it. I'm reading what you told me to read. Well, turn to page 51 and volume 4. Volume 4, page 51. Yeah, Gov, at 8.30, about 16 switch engines start tearing around the bright Kentucky... I'll get that. Okay. Hello? Oh, yes. Oh? Uh-huh. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Okay. Goodbye. Uh, who is that? Stacy Yappa. Oh, the fellow that invited you to come and give a talk? Mm. What'd Mr. Yap want? He won't be on hand to hear me speak tonight. No? No. What's his excuse? He has to take his cousin to the dentist. Which concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block. 
Well, sir, it's about 7.30 o'clock as our scene opens now. And here in the living room of the small house, halfway up in the next block, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Cook and uh, their Mr. Rush Cook spending a quiet evening at home. The male members of the family are seated on the Davenport with sections of the newspaper, while wife and mother sade in her husband's easy chair, industriously men's gentlemen's socks. And now there's conversation. Vic, will you be a wonderful, fine, elegant fella and do something without kicking and complaining? Oh, it's this now. Well, will you? Will I what? Do a person a tiny little trivial favor without making enormous... I've opened no Dr. Sleech. What you got up your sleeve? <laughs> Turn it. Here I am trying to ask my husband to do something for me and scared he'll put up a holler. Must be quite a something you have in mind asking. It's nothing. Nothing at all. Hmm. Wouldn't take 15 minutes of your time. Hmm. Wouldn't take 10 minutes of your time. Oh, Sunday say. Well, sir, I see you people have struck up a conversation. My joy, I believe. Be out downtown tomorrow afternoon. What? <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake. What's eating your mother necktie, class? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I believe I'll take my newspaper out in the kitchen where I can read in peace and quiet without hysteria. Oh, no. Hey, I'll tell you what I said. What'd you say? Well, will you meet Miss Afferat downtown tomorrow afternoon? What for? Exchange some merchandise in at Yamilton. Oh, lady stuff. Exchange some merchandise in at Yamilton? Yes. Perhaps you'd best explain. Well, I'm afraid you'll scream like a panther. Is it his gravy boat here, surmise? Lady stuff? Yes. I want no part of it. No, Vic, you've got to be a sport and play ball. I refuse to become involved in any ridiculous situation it where a gang of women... won't require 15 minutes of your time. won't require 10 minutes of your time. Why should I meet Miss Apparat downtown tomorrow afternoon? Because you're the uh, husband. Lady stuff, lady stuff, lady Nobody stuff. Nobody said anything to you, mister. I was only thinking mm -hmm. of... Well, don't. Oh. Why should I meet Miss Apparat downtown tomorrow afternoon, Sadie? Because you're the husband. Oh. Here's the thing of it. Remember that little Christmas present of mine you got hidden away? No. Sure you do. No. The package the Thimble Club ladies give you to hide. Oh, those wash rags? Don't say wash rags. I'm not supposed to know anything about wash rags. Oh. Ladies, stuff. You appreciate what I'm talking about now? Very, very vaguely. The Thimble Club ladies give you a package with a Christmas gift inside it, and you were supposed That to... wasn't me. That was Rush. They give it to Rush to hide. Here, Rush, you chat with Mama. I'm going out in the kitchen. No, sir, now you sit still. It was Rush had the passage. Wasn't it Rush, Rush? <laughs> it certainly was, Gob Gob. It was Rush. Well, we'll make out like it was you. Better not have children in on this. Miss Apparat don't want to meet children downtown. Say, please. Here's the thing of it. Since the Thimble Club ladies bought me them wash rags for Christmas, the Hamiltons have got in a new stock of wash rags that's a million percent better quality. Same price and all, but a million percent better quality. Ms. Apparat found out about this new stock of wash rags and naturally wanted to exchange the ones the ladies bought me for the nicer ones. Sadie, please. Why do you keep saying, Sadie, please? I don't want to meet Miss Apparat downtown. You got to meet Miss Apparat downtown. You're the husband. Oh, lady stuff. Miss Apparat will telephone you tomorrow morning at the office. She'll ask you to dig up my Christmas present out of its hiding place and bring it down to Hamilton's at some specified time. She'll be there to meet you, and the two of you will exchange the merchandise. That's absolutely all there is to it, and like I say, it won't require ten minutes of your time. But why? Why? You appreciate why. I don't. I take my solemn oath I don't. Well, this is just talky-talk. Rush, my boy. Maybe you can throw some light on this bewildering business. Sure. It's just lady stuff. To begin I'm with... I'm not supposed to know the Thimble Club ladies give you a Christmas present for me. I'm 100% ignorant there's a package hidden away someplace here in the house. That's strictly between you and the Thimble Club ladies. That's your own little wicked secret. My own wicked little secret. Did you hear that, Rush? My own wicked little secret. Lady stuff. After the holidays, we can all have a hearty laugh. Hey, what's the idea, Miss Apparat? You meeting my husband downtown on the sly. He told me about it. He told me how the two of you sneaked down to Hamilton's and exchanged my Christmas present. Oh. Why, George, I believe this is the worst lady so stuff tomorrow I tomorrow noon after dinner, you dig the package out of your hiding place when I'm not looking. Keep it under your coat so I can't see. And take it down to wherever you arrange to meet Miss Apparat. See, will you talk to me man to man a minute? Sure. In the first place, I don't even know where the wash rags are hidden. Will you quit saying wash rags? You said you'd talk to me man to man. I will. But quit saying wash rags. Mm. 
I don't know anything about any wash rags. Uh -huh. If you have something to say, why, well, say package. I don't even know where the package is hidden. Well, I certainly don't. Huh. Get Rush off to one side when I'm not around. Come him for information. I forgot. You forgot what? Where you hid the wash rags. Way back in the buffet. Oh. Did you hear that, Vic? Yeah. Tonight, when I go to bed, I'll take the package upstairs and put it in your dresser drawer. Then you won't get to fishing around in the buffet and mussing up my folded tablecloths and things. Sadie, would you give me a frank, honest answer to a question or two? I won't answer any foolish questions. Since you know you're getting wash rags for Christmas, since Miss Apparat knows you know it, why can't you simply exchange them yourself? I call that a foolish question. The lady stuff. Yes, I call that a foolish question. The best part of Christmas presents is the surprise. You know that as well as I do. The Thimble Club ladies want their gift to be a surprise. That's why they give it to you on the sly and told you to hide it where I couldn't find it. But you hid it yourself. I don't believe we require any comments from you, Rush. Oh. But you hid the package yourself, Sade, and you knew wash rags were inside. Oh, that's all ancient history. I've forgotten all that. I'll be terrible surprised and thrilled Christmas morning when you scalawags hand me my gift and tell me it's from the Thimble Club ladies. Will you also be terribly surprised and thrilled when you find out Miss Apparat and myself had a secret meeting downtown in Hamilton? Well, of course. I don't feel very well. Goodness, what notions of talky-talk over some little, tiny, trivial business that ain't worth a hill of beans. Why, George, in the entire course of my career... Something I... on your chin. Yeah? Breadcrumbs, looks like. Oh. Yes. One more question, Sadie. Yeah? Does Miss Apparat know that I know she's going to telephone me at the office yes. in the morning? You girls talk that all over. Yes. Right? She hesitated to call up and ask you if there was any chance you might turn her down. I said I'd fix it and let her know. Then Miss Apparat knows that I know that you know that she knows that we all know. Oh, my head's beginning to spin. Well, I should think it would. All this big, enormous chatter over nothing. Mm -hmm. You'll do this little measly favor for me, won't you? Mm -hmm. Well, will you? Uh, Fine. Uh, Take the package down with you underneath your coat tomorrow noon. Bring the other package back home with you underneath your coat. You can put it in your dresser drawer, and I'll get it and hide it again in the buffet. How you trim yourself, huh? I don't think we need sarcasm and trash. Goodness, you'd take all the fun and surprise out of Christmas. I'm a monster, no mistake. And look, now, don't you sulk and pout when you meet Miss Apparat tomorrow. You and her have hatched up this wicked stunt between you, see. Laugh and make jokes about how you... Terrible scalawags are pulling the wool over my eyes. Oh. And then after the holidays, we can all have a big dandy laugh over how I got completely fooled. I'm not feeling well. Oh, I expect you live. Oh, no. Well, I guess I'd better notify Ruthie you agreed to meet Miss Afferoth. Oh, Ruthie? Yes. Well, what's Ruthie got to do with... She's our go-between. Go-between? Yes. Go-between. You hear that rush? Go-between. Lady stuff. Well, you see, I couldn't very well talk this over with Miss Apparat. I'm not supposed to know anything about it. Same thing as this afternoon. What about this afternoon? Well, I said I'd discuss details with Miss Apparat. Well, I didn't. Ruthie talked with her and then called me up and dropped hints. Mm. So now I'll telephone Ruthie and give her the go-ahead to notify Miss Apparat you're expecting her to get in touch with you at the office in the morning. Mm. Uh, 2572X, please. Yes. They may have gone to the picture show. Mm -hmm. Something's on Fred particularly wanted to see. Mm -hmm. What's on, Rush? A Gloria Golden and four-fisted Frank Fuddleman and your stolen hugs and kisses are so sweet, emergency balloon parachutist Gregory. It's all about... Hello, Fred. Yes. Oh, fine. I is she there handy? Will you please, Fred? Game of rummy gun? I don't feel very good. What's the matter? I don't know. I just don't feel very good. I imagine you'll survive. Mm. Hello there, lady. Oh, we're just sitting around the living room here with our teeth in her mouth. Oh, well, I just got through saying to Vic, I bet you people are going to take in the bijou tonight. Uh-huh. He's fine? Why, I suppose. Uh, just a second. You plan on being in your office all uh, morning tomorrow? Oh. Well, do you? Oh. Yes, lady, he'll be there. Why do you ask? Ah, uh, secret. 
Scarlets, huh? You wicked scalawags hatching up some terrible plot I don't know anything about. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I just thought I'd give you a ring, Ruthie. Uh-huh. All right, lady. You bet. Goodbye. They're going to the picture show. What you staring at me so funny for? What are you staring at me funny for? Rush. I asked you a question. I said, what are you staring at me funny for? Lady stuff. Which concludes another brief interlude at the small house halfway up in the next block.